Hi, thanks for joining me on this meditation. My name is Maveen Kora. Today we'll be doing a meditation where I was sitting and listening to a talk by Ramdas of Here and Now, uh, the late Ramdas. He did pass away. Uh, these are some great talks that are uploaded to the Here and Now podcast. Definitely ask you to check that out. Uh, lots of great talks, a lot of great spiritual information, a lot of information on dying and around uh, living and um, understanding who we are as a human species and what we actually mean to each other and interacting with each other. So have a listen to the different podcasts. Today we're going to be listening to episode 57. It is on living and dying in the spirit. So find yourself a nice comfortable place to sit to do the, the meditation. Uh, make sure you got a place, uh, sorry, a book and a pen that you can use to write down any thoughts that come to you. Uh, I think it's a great idea to be able to take some notes on um, different talks we're listening to. Uh, not sure if you can see this or not, but even um, Hanumanji, who is the monkey god in Hinduism, also has books uh, next to him while he's in the meditation uh, state of mind. And I believe he's also taking notes um, during his different meditations uh, so he can learn from his own spiritual practice. So find yourself that nice, comfortable place to sit. Let's get started. It is about a talk about uh, 24 minutes long. So let's get ready to go. Before the summer actually starts, but keep supporting us. We need it and we appreciate it. And until next week, and Ramdas, here and now. Now, every system that has been evolved by a being higher than the system, in other words, the words of the rishis, the rishis were the realized writers who were the vehicles through which the law was spread forth. And in fact, all of the holy writings are just those things. They are the manifestation into word of the living spirit. They're the statement of the laws within the spirit. And every one of these is there in order to help you finish with a place that you have to run through yet. In other words, Christ as a message represents, the Jesus story represents a certain story. And by your opening yourself sufficiently to take in that story, the Buddha story represents a certain storyline. And for you to open yourself enough to take in the Buddha story, the Moses story, the Muhammad story, the Ram story, the Krishna story, the Shiva story, stations in order to give you clues, to give you keys. Now, often the clues are messages that show you where you're not, which is the only clues you really need at the moment. So you can get done with where you're not. Cook the seeds that are uncooked. So you can use, for example, astrology to give yourself a new vector view, vector view, take one, new vector view of your own journey. And that vector view will help you finish another place. All of these forms, enneagrams, exercises are all aids and they're all traps. They are all aids and they're all traps. And the problem is that when you have lived most of your life on one level and suddenly are handed the keys to understand the next level, the amount of power that you're given through it is so awesome to little you that you tend to get hooked. I mean, astrology is power. Because you know more when you understand astrology than you do when you understand the MMPI. And that's the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Or an electroencephalogram. When you really have grokked astrology, 
But the thing is, you, if you're going to embrace it, embrace it, use it, go on. The I Ching, the Tarot, all very high statements, the Tao, extraordinarily high devices for waking you up. Work with them, grok them, become them, and go on. You just eat stuff, and out comes life. Just be a stuff converter. Just pass it up your spine. Pass it up your spine. For those of you that might be confused about the relation of, say, the Tibetan Book of the Dead to the Kundalini Yoga, something like that, you can see the relationship that we are primarily working on moving energy from the gross planes up and up through all the centers, through... Uh, from the lower three centers up through to the seventh center. And when you die, then the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a description of the 49 days after that. See, what happens is your first hand of the full trip, you get the clear white light, first bardo. Okay? And what the monk says to you, who's hanging out with your dead body, he says to your spirit, he says, hang on, this is it. You know, let yourself open. But usually what happens is when a person dies, the light's too blinding because they haven't been ready for it because they've got all these desires and attachments that keep them with finite vision. See, it's the same thing as there is an exercise in India for looking at the sun. You start at sunrise and you focus on the sun and you look directly into it without blinking until it sets. Okay. And the people that do it never damage their eyes. But a person in the United States who might turn on with acid and then look directly into the sun may burn out his retina. And the reason he might do that is because he's focusing, because he's attached, because he's trying to see. And it's only at a very high degree of complete giving up of ego that you wouldn't destroy your body that way. To be able to do it all day long, to sit in the desert. Very high meditation. <coughs> See, but beings at that level are almost ones who can live on light. In other words, they can take energy in from the higher planes and transmute it and use it to maintain their lower planes as well as the higher planes. Those are very evolved beings. Very evolved beings. But some of you, I'm sure, have started to notice you eat less and less. You're less and less desirous of food all the time and don't seem to be falling apart as a result of it. You begin to understand that the whole model about food and oxygen and the whole thing was part of the physical plane package, the nature package. It's a model of who you are, and we all agree to it, most of us. But then somebody goes out of the cave and sees the sunlight and is rushing back and says, it isn't like that at all. So when you die, you go into this first part, of, and then the monk says, hold on to it, but you can't, see, and it's so bright, unless you're a realized being at that point, like Mahatma Gandhi, when he's shot, he doesn't go, I've been shot, or save the republic, or, you know, like, ah, or, you know, get them, or, you know, I love you, or anything. He just says, wrong. Now, we've had enough run of assassinations in this country that we, it's very, we can, we've got a comparative thing. How likely is it for any of the beings that were assassinated in this country to be thinking about the spirit or be thinking in such a way as to free themselves at that point? Because as high and exquisite as the people were who were assassinated in many ways, high and low both together, see, they all had attachments. And that means they'd be right. Ha ha, they want to come back. Because you only are finished with the round of births and deaths with the wheel when at the moment of death, you are so free of attachment that when that all and everything is you, you can be it. And you don't pull back. Like too much, man. Can't ever be too much, but all the energy, it's like 
forcing huge amounts of energy through a system. It just burns out the system. The wires just get crisp, just like that. Many of you have that experience. You turn on, you get huge amounts of energy, and you can't use it. You don't know what to do with it. It just hangs around. Because you can't, you haven't given up certain models of who you are, and those models are what can only use little bits of energy. And you're overloading the circuits, and you say, man, it's too much. I lived with this fellow, Steve Durkee, a very high uh, being, and every time I would say, oh, wow, too much, he'd say, no, just enough. So he got me, I'd get, oh, just enough. <laughs> See, it's like when you take your, a parent who is not, uh, has not been exposed to consciousness expanding experiences or stimuli to the film more. See? They often say, I'm getting a headache. See? How can you stand all this? All the projectors and all the sound and black lights and costumes and, you know, the whole business. How can you stand it? Well, you can't stand it. That's the hope. That you can't stand it. That you say, ah, oh, okay, again. You know, I die so hard. Here we go again. Go ahead, take me. Do with me, not my, but thy will. Not my, but thy will. That's what it's about. It's not the will of the of the cameraman up in the thing or the rock and roll band because they're doing the will and if they're not it doesn't turn you on because you only get turned on by the real spirit and when the real spirit's there man you just open yourself to it you can't bomb out that way really you spend so much time being frightened of demons it really isn't worth it because if you're pure in heart it works I mean every fairy tale tells you it does and they're all just as real as you are I mean, Superman and Orphan Annie, they all exist on astral planes, see? Because man never creates anything. He just remembers. How do you like that? So then when the monk, it's apparent to the monk who is in charge of your death that you're not making it in the first bardo, he starts to tell you how to make it through the second bardo. He says, well, you've blown it on the seventh chakra, but now on the sixth chakra, you could come out on this one, and you don't have to be born again on the physical plane. So when you see this and see this groovy, you know, but for most monks, they say, ah, you know, too much, too much, much too much, still much too much. And so what the Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, is a description of each succeeding lower layer. Finally, you get down to the third chakra, and the monk says, well, you're going to go back again. But when you go back, don't forget. When you get born again, do it quick this time by keeping in mind this. Then you forget that, and then he gives you instructions for lower ones, and finally... <laughs> you start the cycle again. Because you weren't ready to wake up that round. So that it's very apparent that what is going, what is evolving also for, for, along with consciousness, is an entirely different concept and understanding and approach to the process of dying. I have been pushing for a few years the institution called a center for dying place where people come to die consciously. And I thought, you know, most people have to go to hospitals and everybody sits around saying, you're not going to die, you're looking better. Because everybody's freaked, see? Because a hospital is a temple dedicated to life. And death is its worst adversary, so it makes, you know, it's like sitting in church talking about the, the, the devil. You talk about it in whispers. But some people are ready to die consciously. Mm. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. I'm 
sure that child remembers. <laughs> And then the old days, I thought, well, obviously the people that have taken lots of something or other who's known about this will be the perfect guides. So all the unemployed, uh, what are they called, hippies, high, you know, they can all become guides for people who want to die. But the institution is still too far out for the society. Although in India, you can go to the Burning Ghat where people, it blew my mind in Benares, because I came to Benares, the, the Kashi, the city where Indians go to die, because when they die in that city, they are totally liberated. You see, they've consciously chosen to come to that city to die, to be burned on the holy Burning Ghats, because at that point, they become one, and they, they're done. And so I would walk down the street, sometimes high on something or other. This was before I met my guru. And I would look at these people, and they would be dragging themselves across the street, and they'd be wearing a loincloth, and the only, and neck attached to the loincloth would be a little pouch which would have in it the money necessary for the wood for the fire, which would be roughly about $2.80. And they had made it. They were lame and sick and starving, and there was, and they would drag themselves around, waiting for this moment, knowing it was about to come. And I walked through the streets, me Western with my American Express travels checks and my camera and my whole scene, feeling sorry for them. Look at these poor beings. Oh, this is what India is about. What a terrible economic. We've got to do something for these people. Get them off the streets. And at the same time, they were looking at me with total pity because they knew I was a Westerner passing through and I wasn't going to make it like that. See, they had the easy way and I was screwed for many reasons culturally and they felt sorry for me. And we sat there and stood there and passed each there feeling sorry for one another, and it was only later I began to understand where their heads were at. But see, you don't know when that moment's going to be. You don't know the moment you're going to die, unless you're already finished. Then you know. Holy beings in India know the moment, and they say, next Tuesday at three, and next Tuesday at three, they turn around three times, sit down, and leave their body. They send a message, next Thursday, I'm leaving my body, come on by. Ramana Maharshi, when he was dying of cancer, and all of his devotees were crying and saying his arm was all cancer, they said, said Ramana Maharshi, you know, Bhagwan, God, you know, God incarnate, you, you are it all. Why don't you save your body? He says, no, no, it's finished its trip. It's time to go. And they said, don't leave us. And he said, don't be silly. Where can I go? Every minute of your life, since you don't know which the moment is, every moment has got to be lived with your head in the place such that at that moment, that's the moment. It doesn't mean you sit around, is it going to be this moment, this moment? You just build your life so it is every moment. Every moment is the moment of death and rebirth. You get to live that way. Because life and death become so intimately involved with one another that finally they merge and you are you're both at the same moment you're both dying and you're being born always again and again every moment look i am making all things new says jesus over and over again it's all a fresh moment it's the eternal present it's happening for the first time your child walks down the steps and it's buddha meeting buddha for the first time in the morning over the muti and rice or orange juice and coffee or whatever it is it's always the first time again. Because it's just been manifest, just that moment. All over it. See, but knowing about the end point finally creates in you, grokking, feeling about that end point creates in you the thirst for 
hapasia, for austerities, for burning by fire. How do you like that? You, it's like the, you're looking to become a moth to walk into the flame. You're looking for methods to burn out your impurities. You're looking for techniques to get done. Now that isn't, you're not a, a masochist. It's not at that level at all. It's just that once the seed has been planted, you can do nothing else but your sadhana, your spiritual work. You're, you, can't do, you can't get off the path once you're on the path. And once you're on the path, everything you do becomes part of your sadhana. Every single thing, as we said last week with Meister Eckhart. Everything becomes part of it. And you look around for systems. And some of you reach out to systems such as those of, enunciated by Georges Gurdjieff, some through the church and through Christian mysticism, some through Hatha Yoga and Eastern yogic disciplines. And anybody that spends any time putting down anybody else's method is obviously caught in deep illusion. It's very poignant. Because it all is the spirit and it all works if you bring to it a pure enough heart. It may well be bhakti is the way in the Kali Yuga, but all the other ways are the same thing when you are pure. And there are currently examples of people moving up and up and up through layer after layer of consciousness using a variety of different yogas or methods of becoming one or union, yoga union. The method that, that um, I have been working with is called Raja Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga. I did not go seeking Raja Yoga. Raja Yoga was laid on me. I didn't ever seek anything. It all just happened to me. It was as if when I was a psychologist, I saw with the eyes of a psychologist, and then the mushroom was laid upon me, and then I saw with the eyes of a visionary, and then my lack of discipline made me something happen, and then a system is laid upon me, which now I see with the eyes of a yogi. Every, every step, as you get into each new place in your consciousness, you look back on your whole life history and you see that it all had perfect meaning from this place, too. And that a lot of things that seemed background become figures suddenly. So you went all through school, and you did, and if you wrote your biography in one year, you would write, and then I did this, and then I wrote this paper, and then this was published, and I became this. Then another year, you would suddenly be writing about, and I met this interesting kid who sat behind me, who nobody noticed, who, you know, and one day this happened. You begin to see that you are upper gurus, as opposed to satguru. A satguru is the pure life. An upa guru is anybody or anything along the way that takes you one step further, the next message. Birds, dogs, children, accidents, boredom, people you meet all the time, your enemies, they are all your upa gurus because anything that you are perceiving in, in, in this plane is the result of an attachment on your part. You've got to remember the basic rule I gave you last time. Desire creates the universe. Your desires create your universe. So that everything you see or know as called your universe is merely a reflection of your uncooked seeds of desire. Because who you are is it all. You wouldn't be seeing anything if you were who you are. You're only seeing something because you forgot you're it already. looking at your own eyes, looking at your own eyes, looking at your own eyes.
This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Thank you for joining me on this uh, talk uh, meditation while we got to listen to Ramdas speak about living and dying in the spirit. Uh, hopefully you were able to take some great points from this uh, meditation. Uh, I will share with you a couple of, I guess, one of the things I wrote down. Uh, maybe you can also put some thought into it and let me know what you think about the uh, one concept that I took. One of the things that uh, Ram Das was talking about in the vi uh, in the podcast is when Gandhi was shot, his last words were Ram, Ram, Ram. He was repeating the word or the name of God. So I wrote down, when I die or we die, what do you think our last words will be? Will, be, will they be conscious or subconscious? Will we know what we will say? Or it'll, will it just be something that just spews out of our mouth based on whatever that moment may bring? Let me know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, remember to hit the like button on this video. I hope you really enjoyed this talk and listening and uh, sitting together while doing so. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. It would be great if you did. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think you would say as your last words. As well as remember to share this video with somebody else who you believe could use this talk or sitting down with somebody and listening to this talk as a part of their daily practice. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Maveen. I am from discoverylifetoday.com. Have a great day.